Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar on where to find and how to use open courses. My name is Sally Porsley and I'm the technical lead on the Open Education program at the International Centre for Eye Health and I'm the host for today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the third in the series of five monthly webinars that ICH is ho hosting to explore how we as eye health educators can use digital technologies and this concept of open to innovate and improve our teaching practice and address some of the big challenges facing eye care training today. The fact that we need so many more eye care uh, workers in so many of the countries where the burden of visual impairment and blindness is um, the, the most serious. So uh, in our first two webinars we looked at these ideas in some detail and we were very pleased to have Professor Alan Foster and Dr. Daksha Patel speaking, along with Dr. Rob Farrow from the Open University. Um, and I encourage you to, if you're interested in open education, to, to view these uh, videos or download the transcripts from the website. And this is the, the web address here on this page. Okay, so before I start, um, I just want to give you a bit of housekeeping information. Um, we're going to hear our two presenters first, Ms. Joanna Stroud and Dr. Astrid Leck, and they'll both talk for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a short Q&A uh, session at the end. So please, as you think of questions for our presenters, send them in during the talks using the question box on the webinar menu tab, um, and I'll collate them and ask them uh, in the Q&A. You can also download today's uh, presentations from the handout section of the menu tab. Um, and to open up the menu tab, you uh, click on the orange arrow um, at the top if it's in uh, miniaturized view. And finally, just to let you know, we are recording this session and we'll be sharing the link and the transcript in a few days. So if you lose connection or you have to go off, don't worry, it'll all be there afterwards. Okay, so um, today we look at how educators can start to make use of free online courses and also open educational resources digital resources for their learning and to support their teaching practice. And I'm really delighted to be joined by Ms. Jo Stroud, e-learning manager at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and ICH's uh, own Dr. Astrid Leck. So uh, before we get going with Jo's talk, I'm just going to talk briefly, because I know we, we talk about a lot of jargon with open education, so it's always worthwhile quickly revisiting some of the basic definitions. So in, in essence, um, open education can be defined as activity by educators which is aimed at reducing barriers to participation in education. So this might be by providing education at a distance or reducing the cost, um, for example, um, and also by opening up registration so that lots of other people can join in. So in eye care, maybe ophthalmologists have had the most uh, access to professional development, but we know that the whole, training the whole team is incredibly important to deliver good eye health. Um, it's not a new idea. It has a long history. Some people would even say it goes back to the very first universities in the Middle Ages. And I'm sharing a picture here of the, uh, uni the law school at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, which in the early 20th century got rid of all the re uh, entry restrictions so that uh, anybody could apply and start one of their undergraduate courses without having passed um, a restrictive exam beforehand. Open education often makes use of technology, so for instance, uh, TV and radio were used for uh, health information dissemination throughout the 20th century, but it's also about cultural issues, such as equity of educational provision or empowerment of learners and educators. So this little diagram, the blue and orange one at the bottom of this right-hand side of the screen, tries to show that the idea that through open education, which allows much more sharing of knowledge and ideas, we can move from a world where only a few people have the information, to a more networked and equitable situation. Okay, so with rising ed access to digital technologies and the internet, the focus of a lot of open education activity has moved online. And open courses, um, such as the ones that Joe's going to talk about, are free online courses that anyone can register and participate in online. And massive open online courses makes on commercial platforms like Coursera and FutureLearn have been incredibly popular free online courses over the last few years, with millions signing up. And I think uh, the London School's own MOOC program has had, I think, more than 
60,000 uh, learners over the last few years, Joe can clarify. And finally, open educational resources are digital educational materials, such as books or videos or anything really, which have a special copyright license applied, which means that anyone can download, um, use them for their own Assessment. Her work at the school involves providing pedagogical support and staff development opportunities, management of the technology-enhanced learning projects we do here, and educational research activity across both the face-to-face -face and distance learning programs we provide. She's also the project lead for the school's partnership with the FutureLearn MOOC provider, producing a series of massive open online courses in the field of public health. And she has overall responsibility for all stages of the course de design, development and delivery. If you've, take, if you've participated in any of LSHTM's formal distance learning courses or its future learning MOOCs such as Ebola, Zika, Global Blindness, Eliminating Trachoma or Health and Humanitarian Crises, you've benefited from Joe's considerable expertise. Joe, I'm so pleased you can join us today. Let me unmute you. Hello. And I'm Hello. really looking forward... Hi, Joe. I'm really looking forward to hearing you talk about uh, the options available for health professionals looking to find and study free open online courses. So let me hand over control. Cool. There we go. Okay, one second. Oh, I should have updated that. There we go. Cool, one second. Okay, so can you see all of this okay? Yes, I can see it fine. I think you're good to go. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sally. Cool. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. You've got a little bit of an overview of the kinds of work that, that I've been doing at the school. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, you know, some of the terminology bound up within open education uh, and then how you can actually go about finding um, open educational resources, open courses, that kind of thing, because it can be useful just to have a few pointers about where it is that you actually um, need to start. So Sally's touched upon a little bit of this already, but there's you know some pretty wide-ranging terminology for open educational materials, teaching resources, and learning experiences, and um, these can mean quite a lot of different things. You'll also find that the terminology that's employed is used quite interchangeably, which can make things a little bit confusing. But in no particular order, I'm going to discuss some of this um, ter ter uh, terminology now. So we've got two different things up on the screen here. Um, we might talk about looking for uh, open educational resources or OER um, and this can be an umbrella term for much of what we um, we discuss not only throughout this presentation but in terms of, uh, of open education more broadly. Um, however, OER, even though resources is in the title, doesn't solely encompass resources and it can extend to tools to support your approach to teaching um, and staff development. So it could be things like lesson plans, reading lists um, and so on. The second um, thing that we have in the list here is something called Open Courseware or OCW. Um, and these again are sort of free and openly licensed materials that are specific to a particular course uh, or program of study and accessible to anyone at any time via the internet. Now you might describe OCW as a subset of OER um, and that's undoubtedly correct. Um, and they've been around for quite a long time now having preceded what we now know as MOOCs which I'll um, discuss a little bit more in a moment. Um, but the um, the open uh, the open education consortium defines them as a as a free and open digital publication of high quality, um, typically university level educational materials. Um, but the distinction between OCW and, and OCR more broadly is that um, that they are uh, bound up within um, or, or from a specific uh, course. They don't, however, offer a, a course experience as such. And that's where we move on to things like open courses. So 
These are full course experiences, but again, they can take you know, many, many different forms. Here we're discussing those which are free in a monetary sense, but in many cases only to a certain extent. Um, and that's where you know, conversations around the degree of openness come into play. I'll, I'll touch upon that again in a moment. Um, they are, however, typically free of entry requirements and thus open to anybody who would like to study on them. Um, a very common term for, for the ones that we're discussing here is MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course. But I think that it's important to think about open courses in a broader sense because they're not the only type that we have access to. Um, and then finally here, open access research and publishing is something that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about too much because we're thinking more about educational materials. But the open access movement via both uh, open institutional research repositories and established journals like this London School's uh, Community Eye Health Journal is becoming stronger and stronger and is undoubtedly part of the work that we're doing in open education. So broadly, what brings this varied terminology together is that open educational material tends to be freely accessible, um, it's, it's openly licensed documentation or media that's valuable for learning, teaching and assessment, but openness in it is in itself quite a tricky term and there can be varying degrees of open. The image that I've used here is a, is a reasonable analogy for this, you know, it's, it's one of, an, uh, of a door. A door might be slightly ajar, it might be pushed or propped open with a doorstop, but in either case it is open, we can't really debate that. That's undoubtedly true with um, open educational materials and particularly things like open courses, which might be free to study, but tasks like um, exams or uh, buying a certificate to prove your attendance, they might incur a fee and that's where, we, where things start to get a little bit muddier. So, moving on to, you know, more practically where you can obtain these kinds of resources, we're going to start with OER and open courseware. Um, a really great place to start searching for both of these is um, uh, the uh, um, Merlo, which is a platform that's made available by uh, California State University, um, but it acts as a sort of curated collection of um, free and open online learning, teaching and academic development resources um, as well. And these come from educational institutions across the world. Um, these can be searched or, or broken down and browsed by academic discipline, uh, the contributing member or institution, and then also by the type of resource as well. Um, another useful tool is the Open Education Consortium's course search, which works in collaboration with Merlo. I've put these around the wrong way on here. Um, but you can also use that to search for specific keywords, which um, will flag a number of different resources relating to that discipline, and it can act as a useful uh, starting point um, as well. You can additionally, with that tool, search through um, a number of, um, no, like a directory of individuals and organizations with expertise in, um, in, in OER or open access practices and publishing, uh, and in, then even things like open course development and delivery as well. So if it's something that you do want to get into and you don't have the resource available at your organization, um, then that is, that's a use, useful resource for you too. Um, another location that you can search is something called OER Commons, which does a similar sorts of things to, um, to the previous two examples. You'll find a lot of people there with, with a lot of different expertise and there's a, there's a, there's a search facility contained within it too. In terms of thinking more specifically about open courseware, um, that movement really took off um, probably about 15 years ago at this point, so it's a long time now, um, with, with the launch of MIT's open courseware platform. Um, now, as you might expect, the resources that they make available are naturally more targeted towards the disciplines that they, um, that they teach and research, so they're quite heavily weighted um, towards things like engineering, technology, mathematics and science, but there are um, a number of courses that they teach around health and life sciences too. However, um, some of the you know, the, the, the absolute best open courseware in the context of public health can be found um, with John, uh, Johns Hopkins University in the United States. So all of their course material, um, or courseware, is Creative Commons licensed, um, and they have an absolute wealth of resources spanning the entirety of the disciplines covered by the, uh, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. So this stuff like health policy, infectious diseases, uh, child, adolescent, and maternal health, nutrition, epi epidemiology, everything you could think of, and probably everything that you you might you might want as well. They've they've really thrown everything into um, making their material available. So it's well worth checking out their uh, their open courseware site. Um, 
in the UK, we have um, OpenLearn from the Open University. Um, it was a sort of precursor to, the, to their FutureLearn partnership, but it's, it's still a you know, really valuable resource. Um, and it features a very broad range of uh, articles, videos, interactive resources, but then also some full and open courses um, that could potentially be linked to and reused as part of your, your own delivery. Um, there are you know, also a number of other uh, indexing services uh, and collaborations from lots of different regions across the world. So this isn't something that just um, that just happens in, in the United States or, or in the UK or Europe. Um, we have you know real pockets of activity all over the all over the world. Um, so one example that I've given here is the uh, African Health OER network. That's worth checking out. Um, but then you also have uh, big databases um, at places like the University of Southern uh, Queensland in uh, Australia and Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong University, as you might imagine, in, in Shanghai. Um, there's plenty out there. So it, yeah, worth worth checking them out. Worth googling them. So we move on to open courses. So this is something, obviously, as, as Sally said, that I've been doing, you know, spending a, a lot of time doing for the past couple of years. Um, our primary avenue at the moment for, for access, accessing uh, open courses is through these sort of commercial, massive open online course providers. Now, all of them were born of at least light association with with higher education institutions but they're now largely uh, for, for profit ventures and you know lots of people have lots of different opinions about this I know that I certainly do um, future learn um, this is uh, with, with you know the, the uh, provider with whom the London School of uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is aligned is wholly opened by the open University in the UK um, and is partnered with both university and non-university organizations across the world. They're slightly different to the other two in that sense. Um, Coursera was founded by Stanford professors, and edX is a joint venture from, from Harvard and MIT. Now, while the business models for each of these um, sort of respective platforms developing all the time, each of them does maintain a, a sort of free-to-study Mod, uh, model and is thus um, loosely open in, in, in that sense. Not, not truly anymore, sadly, but, but certainly um, loosely. Now, the breadth of courses available from um, uh, via these MOOC providers and from the world's you know, very best uh, educational institutions is really you know, quite exceptional and it's well worth exploring each of them to see what, what is available. Um, Johns Hopkins, again, I, I will name check them again, they um, are based I think exclusively on Coursera, I might be wrong about that, but they have tons and tons of courses on there and they're, they're well worth going, a look, going and having a look at. I met their team. Um, about 18 months ago at this point, and they were really, really passionate about what they were doing um, and uh, have done an awful lot of work in this area, so it's worth checking out their stuff. Um, but yeah, we're, we're based on FutureLearn, and I will talk about that a little bit more um, in a moment. Um, other avenues, slightly different avenues, these sort of non-commercial um, uh, platforms include the uh, the European Multiple MOOC Aggregator, nice catchy name there, this is why they've used a useful acronym of EMMA. Um, it's a multilingual MOOC platform, uh, it's supported by the European Union, I think it's something like a three-year funded project, um, but that contains courses that are delivered by a number of different European universities and organizations. You've got um, institutions like the University of Leicester in the UK, Parma in Italy, uh, UNESCO are also um, quite involved with that platform too. Um, courses again are available across a range of different disciplines. Um, and this one's slightly interesting in that the project acts as not only a host for the courses, but it's a development tool as well. Um, so if you know that you don't have um, a sort of partnership organization that you're working with, um, it might be worth checking that out to see if there's, see if there's something that you can um, do with them. Another option here is um, Allison, um, which is in effect another MOOC provider, but one that focuses a little bit more on CPD. Um, the, the, the way that the courses are, are uh, developed and structured is quite simple, um, but the reason for that is that they want to be able to reflect and properly cater for their learner base, um, the majority of whom are based in low and middle income countries, which is um, substantially different to, to what we might term the, the big three. I think something like 40% of their, their user base is in India. Um, which is quite an interesting prospect. So that's something to check out too. They've got they've got plenty of stuff on there, um, and there are some global health resources too. 
Um, so to sort of wrap up, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, open education at LSHGM just to give you a little bit of a flavour of the kind of work that we've been doing. Um, as I've mentioned already, the school's been partnered with FutureLearn since uh, summer 2014 um, and we deliver free online courses in the field of global health. Uh, our courses today have attracted, I'm going to update your figure now Sally, more than 80,000 learners um, and, and healthcare professionals from uh, I think more than 190 countries and territories which you know we're, we're, we're really really proud of. Of, um, but we also would kind of expect based on the kind of work that we do already. Um, course titles that, that we've delivered have been uh, relatively specific, so we've got Ebola in context, we've got global blindness and eliminating trachoma from, uh, from the Centre for Eye Health. Uh, we also have improving the health of women, children and adolescents, uh, preventing the Zika virus and health and humanitarian crises. And then the one that we're currently working on will be a history of public health uh, in sort of post-war period um, in, in Britain. So that's another interesting one that's forthcoming. So these courses, uh, it's, it's very important to us that they are sort of uh, are, are completely free to study. Um, they're open learning opportunities during the course duration, um, but certificate, uh, certificates for participation or attainment are made available as a paid product in line with other MOOC providers. Uh, the school is an active member of uh, Future Learn Development Forums as well. This was, you know, this is a really key thing for us to be involved in, um, and we're a really strong voice in support of learners from low and middle income countries. Uh, we do our, you know, we do our best to provide. Um, as much information as we can to future learn around the differences and considerations that need to be made in terms of uh, the needs of learners uh, in, 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 in these uh, kinds of regions. And so, you know, it's a really paramount important to us that the openness of these courses is maintained as far as possible, because if they're not, there's, um, it, it's quite difficult to maintain parity of access for everybody. Um, you know, there's a danger of them only being uh, available to people who are in quite privileged positions or those with who have greater purchasing power, and that would be a real shame to me. So this is something that the school um, does talk a lot about when they when they speak to future and hopefully we're doing a good job of that. And then finally, the other thing that we've been doing, um, we have something called the Open Study uh, platform. Um, this is something that acts in addition to our sort of uh, cohort-based course experiences offered by what we do with FutureLearn. Um, so on this platform, we also house all of the, uh, the course materials. You could call them open courseware. Um, from those courses on the FutureLearn platform, we, we, put, we put those onto open study. Uh, we make them available with a Creative Commons license that allows individuals to uh, download, repurpose, and remix the content with attribution. But the platform does also give us the opportunity to make open access courses available, you know, non-affiliated um, with, with a MOOC provider. Uh, some of these offer the opportunity to request paid uh, certificates. Um, all I would really say is that this is quite an experimental platform for us at the moment and we're still working on it, but we do hope to develop it more in future um, and, you know, the, the Centre for Eye Health will play quite a big uh, part in that, I think. Um, so that's about all I've got to say about um, open courses at the moment. I'll, I think we're waiting till the end for um, more questions, aren't we, Sally? So probably hand over to Astrid now. Um, thank you so much, Joe. I'm going to nip in before Astrid. Yeah, um, go for it. And, and just say thank you so much. It was so interesting. You, uh, there's several, uh, there's so much out there to look and you have picked up on a number of, I think, key places for edu eye, eye care and health education to go and look. Yeah. I, I must go and have a look at the John Hopkins platform again. Yeah, again. It's, yeah they, they, to be frank, they've pumped so much money into it that you would expect um, the yeah. kinds of results, but, but, but yeah, no, they've, they've got some really fantastic stuff available. Um, uh, yeah, I would just say that, again, you can search Google for all of this material. That's kind of why the terminology is, is reasonably important, but provided you've got your sort of disciplinary keywords and then you've got, you know, you're looking for OER, you're looking for OCW, that kind of thing, you will find an awful lot out there now. So this is just, you know, a little bit of an introduction to the resources that are there on a number of different websites, but just whack it into Google and you will you will find plenty more. That's a great point about Google. It's like you, you've been watching me um, in my own work because that's the first place I can and then I check that's the last day. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, 
Okay, so um, I'm now, um, I hope you're thinking of questions. I've seen there's a couple of questions come in already. Um, so keep putting your questions in. Um, I'm now uh, just oh, just to remind you that if you, uh, if you it's click the orange arrow on the webinar menu tab to open up the question box to put your question in. So now I'm delighted to introduce our second presenter, uh, Dr. Astrid Leck. Astrid's original undergraduate training was in medical microbiology before she moved on to specialize in medical mycology. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Astrid. And all Astrid, the presenter, what's that talk? There we go. So uh, Astrid is joining us today to talk about what we as eye health educators need to know about copyright to enable us to download and start to use these resources that Joe was talking about in our own teaching practice. Okay, um, thank you so much, Astrid. I think I need to let you speak, if I can. Oh, I think you need to unmute yourself, Astrid. That's hello. Oh, great. Hello. We have you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about copyright and I shouldn't really have called it demystifying copyright because that's a very big claim. But I'll try and give you some insight in, into it. Um, just what copyright means for content development in the traditional sense and what it means in the context of open education. And just to talk a little bit about Creative Commons, which um, Jo has mentioned, just to give a really brief overview of what Creative Commons licensing is all about. So I'm sure that within academic, certainly in academic um, areas, we're familiar with the requirements that we normally have put on those when we use data, tables, photographs, or excerpts from people's texts or articles, um, and how we have to um, acknowledge that. So um, adding web links, giving references, um, and saying when we access the source, if it was online. And in some cases, we actually have to seek permission to use them at all. So copyright really um, gives you very all-round robust protection so that other people can't use your work without your permission. And that's the normal, I think I'd be fair to say that's most people's general perspective that copyright means you have restrictions and limitations put on using and reusing other people's work. Um, in terms of open courses, the idea is, as Joe's already said in, in detail, that um, is that we're trying to provide an interactive resource which is widely accessible, that being the key. And to make it accessible as widely as possible, we need to make the content accessible to people without the restrictions that are normally imposed. So that we can, but it needs to obviously be high quality um, because then we, we're using this really to train people as, and for them to go on and have a sort of, um, so it adds on so that they will become um, more knowledgeable themselves and then hopefully go on to train others. Um, to achieve this, our content needs to be free of normal copyright restrictions because we want people to not just access it, them, the materials themselves, but we want them to go on and reuse them and use them to train other people. And in their local setting, the way that we present information may not be um, as relevant or applicable and we want them to go away and develop it and use it in a way that maximizes their potential to train others as well. So what we want to do is use copyright-free, high-quality images when we're illustrating things, data that can be freely distributed and shared um, so that people can do exactly that. So in order to do that, we have used Creative Commons licensing. 
Creative Commons is a not-profit organisation um, that equips and enables people and institutions to reuse a creative to knowledge um, and provides the legal tools, again, freely available to us to um, best equip us to do so. So a Creative Commons licence is one of um, several public copyright licences that should enable free distribution of otherwise copyrighted work. And it's, it's used when people want to be able to share and build on something that someone else has already created to optimise its use in their situation or in their educational um, setting. Um, there are differences between Creative Commons and copyright, and it, and it may be a little bit, in some cases it feels a little bit subtle, but Creative Commons is a license that's applied to what is protected by copyright. It's not something totally separate from copyright. It's a way of putting different kinds of restrictions around um, material to ensure that it is freely used as opposed to restricted, used in a restricted fashion. Um, Creative Commons licensing structures are used um, to license copyrighted work, but people have to abide by the licensing terms. So it's, it, although we have this idea of open access, open, freely available resources, it's not taking away all permissions, it's, it's saying how we want something to be reused rather than saying you can't reuse it. Which means it's easy to share work without giving up total control of it or spending hours granting permissions. Um, and it might be worth saying that if somebody takes up your creative co your work, which you have put a Creative Commons license around or onto, and they violate that, you can still, you would then be able to pursue that institution in the way that you would if someone had violated normal copyright rules. So we're trying to protect the, we're trying to protect the premise about which our work is used rather than saying, please don't use it without ever um, gaining permission. So there are various licensing types, um, four mainly. One is attribution, so there's licensing around giving credit um, and indicating if changes are made. So we're allowing people to use work, but we may want to ask them to give credit back to uh, or acknowledge the original um, creator of the materials. By placing a non-commercial license on it, we're saying that whoever then goes on to reuse and use our um, resources will not do so for a commercial purpose. Um, you may also put on a license which says that people can copy, distribute, display only the original copy. So if you don't want your work to be modified in any way, if you don't want it to be changed, but you're happy for people to reuse the material in the way that you have initially um, presented it in a MOOC or in an open access course, then you would put that kind of licensing on it if you're concerned that if the data was manipulated or if it was presented in a different way, it might not be representative of the original work. Share alike, um, that just means if you do change and uh, remix or transform or tweak, materials that you have open access to online, you must distribute them under the same license as the original. So you could go away and to redevelop or recreate a teaching tool, for example, but you need to make sure that it's under the same terms of agreement as the original authors put it under. So if they say it must only be non-commercial, you must do, make, also make yours non-commercial. And in addition, um, Creative Commons, basically these licenses state that you cannot apply um, things that legally restrict others from doing anything other than the license permit. So it's really putting a framework around your work and saying, this is how I'd like it to be used. Please use it in this way or reuse it in this way. So we decided to use Creative Commons for our open education resources. Um, and the type of licensing that we use, for example, for our planning for eye care um, OER was attribution, non-commercial, and share alike. So we want people to be able to remix, tweak, and build upon our work to reuse it as long as they credit us and they license their new creations under identical terms, which means that they can share it 
how they need to or how they want to um, in any format, be it if they wanted to take what we had made into a PowerPoint and just give it as a transcript, that's fine. Or if they wanted to incorporate some of our images in a video, then they would need to keep it within the terms that we've put on it. Um, but they are free to adapt it in the way that they feel suits their purpose. And this is just an example of how we would um, attribute our work. So this is a screenshot from um, one of our OERs showing how that actually works in practice. So for, to attribute somebody's work, you would need to, through giving it a title um, and saying who the author is, where the source was, and if it's an image, we would link it to the original Flickr page. And we would then, most importantly, denote it by the license. So here, this license shows that this original image was provided by the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness. And um, these, are the, these are the Creative Commons licenses, as I've shown on the, the previous slide, which we have attributed to those. So if you reuse this image, or you take this image and put it into your teaching materials, or whatever the resources are that you're creating, these are the terms under which you can reuse this particular image. Okay. So this is just a, a diagram, where, um, actually we slightly put together some, uh, to just show how IKO users could, these are examples of how our OERs could be used. So we are saying, please take one of our free online courses download what you need and share it with people that you work with. You can download, if you're a lecturer or an educator and you um, are regularly involved in teaching or training courses, please download and adapt the materials for your own teaching um, and share them, keep sharing them on um, or use them for advocacy. And if you're a manager, you could adapt and share your materials to empower your eye care teams for advocacy to adapt other courses. Um, and so, as it were, we're just passing on. So, although we may have 80,000 people who sign up for the courses, we may have another 80,000 people who then benefit from those initial, like those initial participants in our OERs who are sharing these resources in settings that otherwise these resources wouldn't be available in due to costs or um, just being availability and restrictions like that. So, thank you. If you have any questions, I will and um, be joining Joe and Sally at the end. Thank you so much, Astrid. That was super interesting. Copyright is, I find copyright so complicated and you really helped make, explain how Creative Commons uh, helps educators in, who are working for institutions share their, uh, start to increase the sharing of knowledge in a legal way. So I think as individuals, it's fine to go on Google, you find a picture you like, and you copy and download it for your own use. But when we start to work in formal settings as professionals, we need these legal, this legal support that uh, Creative Commons and other open copyright license offers, don't we? So thank you. Um, let me grab back the, if I can remember how to do it, uh, make presenter. So let's have a look at it. There we go. So if we go back to, so we have, oh, we have a few minutes. We have seven minutes for questions. So this is, and um, we've had a couple in. We've had one in from Dacha, which I think is, um, ah, we've got a couple in from Dacha. So Joe, Joe, I think this one is really for you. Um, do governments and leaders in education endorse and uh, fund OER? Do you know of examples? So what we're, we've been talking about is really how universities have created and funded OER, isn't it? So but do you know of any, um, any wider examples? Um, I think one, one that I often come back to, um, they do tend to be, obviously they do tend to be produced in universities, but I can't, there is a really good example that I've got uh, that was from the OU, and I think a collaborative uh, funding arrangement with the UK and Indian government. It was for a project called TESS, 
which I can't remember exactly what it stood for, but it was around teacher education, so I imagine that's what the T and the E stands for. Um, but I think the Open University had created a series of um, uh, learning resources for UK teachers and there was then some additional funding from um, from the UK and Indian governments where those resources were contextualized for use um, in uh, classroom settings in India um, so it's kind of it's quite there's a bit of a parallel between what you guys have been doing with um, your um, eye health resources around you know contextualizing them for local context that that kind of thing um, yeah that, that that's pretty much the only thing that I can think of at the moment it does it does tend to come out of universities at the moment and the onus is placed on us um, to, to make our material available but I'm sure I could find something else yeah I, I heard of um I think the Bangladesh government did something about 10 years ago with uh, K, um, uh, secondary level education where they created a lot yeah. of standard textbooks but uh, yeah yeah I think they're kind of a few one-off examples around the world thank you for the yeah. shout out for our uh, for our localizing of courses I'm I'm delighted I'm sat here with Neo Ira from Kenya who's who's going to be talking in our next webinar about mm. about that experience so to let the attendees know that please next next month will be even more about how how educators actually go about this process yeah. It's super important, is it, for you know, for capacity building? You know, but it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to create uh, learning resources for for one setting. I think it's possibly a little bit arrogant to think that what we created for one setting would be would you know be be of any use whatsoever in another. So I think that's really really important work. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Yes, um, and actually that leads beautifully onto the next question, which is, um, and I'm going to pass this toss this one to Astrid. Adapting and sharing, is that a strength or a weakness in open education, do you think, Astrid, or is it both? <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's probably more of an advantage because, like you've hinted or it, it, and we've talked about, it, you do need contextualization. Um, I suppose the disadvantage is that somewhere along the line, things might get a little bit lost or a little bit misinterpreted misinterpreted but I think generally if people are taking things and wanting to adapt and share them I'd imagine that their um, motivation is to educate others and therefore to get to get the message across in the most appropriate and most accurate way mm. Mm. Is, that, is that kind of what you feel too Joe? Yeah, I, I, yeah no definitely I think that Astrid put that quite succinctly actually <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, we actually, Joe, I'm, I want to take you back to your presentation briefly because we lost, a few of us lost sound just as you got to a really interesting bit about um, okay. global sources of um, OER. I think you were just starting to talk about the African Health OER network. Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that I was saying is that uh, these resources aren't just based out of, you know, massive um, state United States institutions in the UK and Europe um, there are lots of other indexing services and collaborations um, from uh, all sorts of different regions across the world so the African Health OER network is is one of them and obviously they have a really great array of um, resources that are uh, specific to um, African country contexts uh, but they do have stuff outside of that as well um, but then if you um, go a little bit further afield you have places like the University of Southern Queensland, they have a big database, and Shanghai Jiao Tong University also has a, an open courseware database too. But there are plenty more out there. Um, it's, it's, it's not just those. Again, if you if you search for something like open courseware, you'll find um, resources for this ac across the world. It's not just something that's that's located in one or two specific regions. Hmm. You raise a great point there with uh, the China platform about mm. language. So I think yeah. a lot of your content is still in English, isn't it? Yeah, lots of it is. Lots of it is. Um, it's, it's why it's it, the, the things like the uh, the Emma network, where you do have uh, proper sort of multilingual courses, are really are really valuable. Um, and again, I will flag that um, that you guys, uh, the, the Centre for Eye Health, are. Uh, producing the, the your, your first MOOC course, Global Blindness, you're now translating that into French. 
um, which again I think is is an excellent idea. It's again quite unfair to you know to keep all of this all of this um, you know wonderful mm -hmm. material in English. Um, and, you know, and I'd encourage anybody that's thinking about doing these kinds of things to take a little bit of time to think about what the most appropriate language. Um, you know, to to use would be even if it's not your you know not your native one. Think about what you could be doing longer term because, obviously, using uh, using a language like French or Spanish or you know Arabic um, mm. massively broadens the reach of that material. And it's you know once once it's done the first time, it's not it's not that hard to get it translated to another language, and that means that you can reach you know a whole new possibly huge audience. Mm. Mm. We're very hopeful to get the global blindness. Mm. I could really use this in my own setting, my own institution. Um, what things should they really think about before they start to apply a Creative Commons license? What, what kind of, because um, it's not completely straightforward, is it? So, um, and, and even, uh, and possibly this is probably a bit of a tricky question. What kind of things should influence which version of the license they should choose? Hi, Sally, I lost you there, but I've heard the second half, so I think I know what you're asking. <laughs> um, I would say the most important thing is to go to the Creative Commons website, um, mm. because they have a whole wealth of information on there. They have um, a sort of a selection process. They can take you through how you should choose your license and what is appropriate by asking you questions about how you want to use it and by giving you more detail about each aspect of licensing. Um, on an international level, there are, there are similarly, there are, I would say you need to know where you are, you need to know the local restrictions on copyright and use um, in terms of the institutional workplace where you are. But also there are, again, um, bodies like in Rights Direct, which is an international copyright um, resource as well online which gives a lot of information about sort of how copyright is um, used and applied internationally and World Intellectual Property Organization also they have a, um, a lot of information too so I would say start with Creative Commons and think about what you want to do with, with your particular resources and, and what limitations you might want to do but hand in hand with um, what you know where you're actually based, what the local restrictions and national restrictions and regulations are, and then um, maybe use that as your starting point. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, thank you both. I have lots more questions, but we are out of time. So um, thank you again, and I'm, I'm just going to quickly wrap up this uh, uh, webinar by firstly thanking our funders. So as I think Dutch's question uh, raised, OER is not completely, we needed money to get this program going that we're involved in. And to invite you, and we're very grateful for the support we've had from a number of very generous people. And I, I would also very much encourage you, if you are an educator and you think this, in my context, maybe if we got together and we're thinking about developing our, our training at the moment, this could be a good way forward. I strongly encourage you to join us next time. We're, we're really excited to have Nia Weira and uh, Professor Colin, Nia Weira is from Kenya, and Professor Colin Cook from uh, South Africa, who are going to talk about their experiences of taking um, uh, the Global Blindness Open Course, which we, deliver, uh, we developed here at LSHTM, and adapting it and embedding it in their own local uh, curriculum and uh, finding accreditation for it. So I'm really looking forward to that one. It's on April the 19th, same time, and that web link there is you can register now so that you'll get reminders um, about where to turn up and the link. You can find out more about our ICH Open Education Programme on our website at that address. Um, so thank you again. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope we get to see you next time as well. All right. Uh, take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
Bye. Thanks.